Hello students, let's continue from uh, where we left last time. So in the last lecture we discussed about the constraints uh, that space-time symmetries impose on the uh, kind of forces that we can have. Okay, we saw for example that time cannot appear explicitly in, in the forces. Okay, and that's true if your system is isolated from all other things. I mean, uh, if only if you are if your system is not influenced by something external. Okay, if that is not the case, then of course the forces can be time dependent. But if you have isolated system, then the forces uh, which are acting on individual particles within the system are uh, not dependent on time. Also, you saw that um, that the forces cannot depend on the absolute locations of individual particles. Okay, they can only know about the rel uh, r relative uh, separation between the constituents. Okay, and similarly, you saw that um, that that the fact that physics does not change in going from one inertial frame to another inertial frame implies that those forces cannot depend on what the velocities are in a given reference frame. They can only depend on the differences in velocities of different particles. Okay, So that was our first experience with um, the use of symmetries of space and time and we will have more occasions to do these things later as well. Now today we want to proceed by um, looking at the coordinates that we have used more carefully, okay? So till now I have been, whenever I have been sp uh, uh, s speaking of where the particles are located, I always assumed that the coordinates are Cartesian coordinates, okay? And um, for us, there was no reason to use any other uh, coordinate, uh, and that's why we use Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so now we want to talk a little more about coordinates, and that's what the plan is for this short video. Okay. So what I said just now is that till now, we have used the Cartesian coordinates. So if I'm specifying the configuration of the system, okay, of system, okay, I was using the coordinate, coordinate co uh, coordinates RI, okay, and by this RI I mean XI, y i and z i okay uh, it's clear that there may be situations when using cartesian coordinates may not be the um, best thing to do for example if you are uh, looking at let's say a planet which is going around sun in a circular orbit okay it's clear that uh, it's not such a useful thing to do to use x, y, and z components to tell where the planet is located. Okay, it will be more natural to use the polar coordinates. So you would use, for example, the radial distances away from the sun, the polar and azimuthal angles. They will be uh, more natural coordinates because they know about the symmetry of the problem. See the force which is acting between the sun and the planet is central, okay? Meaning it depends only on the distances between these two objects, the sun and the planet, okay? So you want to use a coordinate where this symmetry becomes apparent and clearly using your uh, polar coordinates will be more useful. So one reason why you may want to use a coordinate other than the Cartesian coordinates is purely the symmetry of the problem. 
symmetry of the problem may dictate for example use polar coordinates okay or it may say okay you you should use cylindrical coordinates cylindrical coordinates so that's one uh, simple way of understanding why you might be interested in different coordinates there's another uh, reason why you would like to use coordinates other than cartesian coordinates imagine you have one particle okay and that particle is moving along a specified curve okay meaning it can go let's say it can go only imagine a thread here imagine a thread being given here okay and you say that your particle can only trace this thread so it can on, always be on this thread and you have already told the the way in which that th thread is placed okay and there may be certain forces acting on this uh, this particle uh, it might be getting pulled and pushed by other things but it still always remains on the thread now is using cartesian coordinates a useful thing to do well that would be an overuse of things because you don't really need to tell where uh, i mean to tell where that object is located you don't need to tell three numbers you don't need to tell what the x coordinate is what the y coordinate is and what the z coordinate is okay clearly it's an over specification what you need to tell is how far along the curve it is from some chosen point o so you choose let's say let, let me draw it it will be probably easier to understand let's say you are given some some such curve okay and you have your particle sitting here and this guy is moving along along the curve now if i want to tell where it is let's say i choose some point as a reference point o and if i tell okay go along this curve for 3 meters and you'll find the particle that one number 3 meters is sufficient to tell where it is you don't need to tell me three numbers you don't need to tell me x y and z okay so clearly if you are studying such a system you don't need to use cartesian coordinates okay let's call the distance along this curve to be q okay that's a notation i will use this is your um uh first instance of using a coordinate which we call a generalized coordinate okay in this case it is still a distance but we'll see more examples where a generalized coordinate may not even have the dimensions of of length okay so i hope you uh, understand that it may be more natural to use other coordinates rather than cartesian coordinates okay i'll give you another uh another example for that i should go to next page which is here it, it did work yes um okay look at this um very commonly used example uh so there is some ceiling and from that ceiling you have suspended one pendulum okay and from this pendulum this this bob this mass you have attached another pendulum okay now my system is these two masses okay i'm assuming the 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 strings to be massless weightless and massless and they are just there to support the masses now i ask how many numbers you should tell me to tell exactly where those two particles are located okay now you may say okay we need to specify let's call this particle 1 and particle 2 so they have the masses 1 and 2 so very naively you might think that i need to specify x1 y1 z1 for the particle number 1 
x2, y2, z2 for the particle number 2. But again, this is an over specification. You don't need those many numbers. Okay, let's say, let's say these two masses are really uh, doing whatever they do in the plane, in the plane of, uh, let's say, this um, whiteboard. Okay, so they are always in the plane. Clearly, you don't need the z1 and z2. They always remain the same. They always remain zero if you choose them to be. But even then, you don't need x1 and y1, x2 and y2. Okay, let's see what let's see we, uh, what you really need to specify. Okay, if you tell me this angle theta one, if you tell me that one, I will know where this guy is. I will know that because this length is not going to change. So I have to tell you the length. If I don't tell you the length, you you cannot know where it is. Okay, so this length of this first string doesn't change let's say l1 and look at the particle number two so this is another vertical line so what i'm saying is from the bob number one you draw a vertical line tell this angle theta two and you will know where this m2 is because the length l2 from this to this is also going to be specified to you so you see this to specify the configuration of the system, you need only two numbers, theta 1 and theta 2. Let me write it down. Configuration of the system. Okay. And this one needs only theta 1 and theta 2. So this is um, another example of generalized coordinates. So instead of six or instead of all these six or even four by if you tell Z1 and Z2 are fixed, you still realize that the constraints of your system impose um, uh, restrictions which leads to the fact that only two coordinates are independent, okay? So what we say is that this system has two degrees of freedom. Okay? Two because two numbers here. Which means that these are the two, these are the uh, independent independent coordinates. Okay. Now you see, you may say, okay, I don't want to use theta 1 and theta 2. I want to use some other combination of theta 1 and theta 2 that you can do, of course. But that will not change the fact that you still, you, you need only two independent quantities, two independent numbers. So whatever transformations you do, you will still realize that only two independent coordinates are required. The minimum number is two and that is what is called the degrees of freedom of the system or, or any system which you are looking at. Let's look at a few uh, examples. Okay, my plan was to give you a few examples as an exercise. Okay, they are uh, very, very simple and I'll write them down. You think about them and then one after the other, I will tell you uh, the answers. Okay, so let's do that. I'll go to next page. I hope it goes. No, it doesn't. It goes. Okay, so some small exercises. Okay. Or problems, yeah. So number one. So first is how many degrees of freedom a free particle has? Okay. So degrees of freedom of a free particle. Okay. By free, I mean a particle on which there are no forces acting. Okay. It's, it's just free. So how many freedom? How many degrees of freedom it has? three 
you need to tell me three numbers x y and z or r theta and phi whatever you like but you need to tell me at least three numbers and then only i will be able to tell you where it is okay so that's three now um how about this what are the degrees of freedom of a particle that is moving in a gravitational field okay what do you think the answer is so while i'm writing you please think about it so degrees of freedom of a particle moving in a gravitational field and what do you think your answer is i mean this could be gravitational field of one planet or let's say imagine there are hundreds of planets around sun everything and then this guy is moving how many degrees of freedom it has well the fact that there are forces acting on this is not going to change how many numbers you need to specify its location it still remains 3 right i hope you uh, understand that part so degrees of freedom still remains 3 another very simple problem imagine now you have two particles both of them are free okay and they do not interact with each other so two particles non interacting there are no forces on it on them how many degrees of freedom so you think about it while i write the question degrees of freedom of a system of two free particles do you have an answer well to tell where the first guy is you need to specify three numbers to tell where the second guy is again you have to specify three numbers so in total you have six okay so each one of them has three degrees of freedom times the number of particles you have which in your case is 2 okay if you have if i ask degrees of freedom of a system of n particles clearly that would be 3 times n and that will be 3n okay now what if you have two particles but they pull and push each other through coulomb force meaning the particles are not free but they are uh, interacting with some forces two of them what is the degrees of freedom of this system well as before this interaction cannot change the number of uh, coordinates you need to specify it still remains 6 okay so degrees of freedom of a system of two particles interacting let's say gravitationally or whatever force you like but it still remains 6 okay so usually students get confused when you say that there are certain forces acting on them and then they they may um get wrong answers okay how about this till now all our particles were free to move in space and it was quite easy to uh answer how many degrees of freedom they have now imagine you have one particle this we already talked constrained to move on a specified curve okay then what then only one because it's a curve does not matter what the shape is okay it's one you tell choose a reference point and you tell the distance along the curve you should go to find that particle and that one number the distance is the degree of freedom so that's one 
it's interesting to see that in a classroom if you ask this question and you draw this curve and you say the particle is moving along this uh, quite a big chunk of the classroom will tell that this is um, the system has two degrees of freedom because they think that it's going up and down somehow so it, it's in a plane and they will think it's two degrees of freedom but no it's it's one and, and you know uh, why i'm saying one okay how about a particle constraint to move on a plane if it is on a plane let's say i put x and y coordinates uh, system then clearly the degrees of freedom will be two you can tell how much you should go along x how much along y and you'll find the particle so two degrees of freedom and clearly if i take a surface whatever the shape of the surface is if it's a surface again the degrees of freedom is two and why is that so that is something you should think about okay okay i'll give you one exercise which you should try to do yourself and we will end with that one um why 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 yes so here is an assignment for you uh, okay so find the degrees of freedom uh, of a sphere okay of a sphere constrained constrained to move on a smooth surface okay so imagine you have a ball okay and this can only move on a smooth surface now pay attention to the word smooth there's no friction at all zero friction so you should first think in what manner this ball is going to move can it roll and then you find out how many degrees of freedom you need to specify where that guy is okay find the degrees of uh, find the degrees of freedom of a sphere constrained to move on a smooth surface by smooth i mean frictionless surface okay we'll um meet next time and look at the solution of this one hopefully you would have done it by then and we'll continue our discussion of analytical mechanics